Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here today, despite the snow. Uh, we're very, very um, happy that you could make it. So today we have two films dedicated to the Philippines. Um, we'll start with a short film by Lia Borromeo, who's with us tonight. Uh, it's called The Mortician of Manila, and it'll be followed by a feature, uh, Beast Mode, a social experiment by Manuel Tercero Messina and Banuk Amante. So I guess what was striking when we see the two films together is uh, the kind of different takes, obviously, <laughs> both aesthetics, but also in terms of um, how you see different positionalities of the people vis-a-vis -vis, um, the fascist regime. So I wanted to ask you maybe, can you say a little bit more about the people you've encountered during the film, like the filmmaking process and how they position themselves? Uh, because it's less obviously like count I mean, to firstly, I don't think people who are actually living that life at the coalface of all of this are essentially positioning isn't really foremost in their thoughts. They're just trying to work out how they're going to get through the next hour, not even the next day. So positioning is, is a kind of luxury that we have because we live in a society where we have the privilege to be able to do so. So the people I met uh, there are totally out of my comfort sphere um, in being a Filipino. I was born into relative privilege, and I still enjoy quite a lot of those privileges um, by the sheer fact that I went to university in a, you know, in a couple of countries twice removed from my own. So, and I'm standing here now. So it's, it's you know, you, you, you kind of just have to acknowledge that that's not really somebody's priority. Um, when it comes to kind of seeing what people's lives were like and being in there and actually living in those lives. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a, if you pardon my swearing occasionally or my light swearing, it was a big kick up the ass, you know. Um, it was a kick up the ass to every person who was working on this film because again, everybody in the film also came from a certain level of privilege to be even able to make one and to even be in that industry. So, you know, to the point where, I think one of the most sort of like telling things was when we decided to get a delivery guy to deliver us a McDonald's breakfast because we really didn't fancy Lugao for breakfast again, which was, you know, Lugao was this kind of, kind of congee dish um, with lots of dead pig. And being a vegetarian, I only had uh, just the congee bit, which didn't taste that good. So, you know, we just ordered in McDonald's. We just thought it was a normal thing, and the guys just looked at us going, you're getting something from McDo? Oh my God. I was like, yeah, sure, we'll order you some. And so we ordered dinner. We ordered our sort of like, you know, our McDonald's breakfast, and all these guys got their McDonald's breakfast, and they were so happy that they, one, were being fed, two, were getting something that was considered a bit of a luxurious treat. So, yeah, for us, something that's sort of disposable, um, and the second best is actually something that's actually sought after. Good. <laughs> no, good, because, because Facebook is one of, the, one of the things and one of the sort of actors responsible for, let's say, Brexit in the UK, um, the election of Donald Trump in the US, and the possible rise, but thank you so much, um, moderate Canadians who really wanted to sit and vote and send a massive sort of resounding oh, I guess we'll just have Trudeau again um, for this time. But it's, you know, it, that, that kind of manipulation of, of, of facts, this, this, this sense of being in this kind of post-truth world where relativism is weaponized and your reality and your sense of reality is actually being used against you so that you could be drawn into one direction, be it through buying more squidgy things on Instagram to voting for the wrong person. Um, it's, it's interesting to me when you say and you talk about, when you look at the Singapore model and you look at Lee Kuan Yew when you look at this basically a functioning Southeast Asian, Southeast Asian dictatorship where if it's not compulsory, it's illegal. Um, and it's like we seem like we're, we're aspiring to something like that. We're aspiring to a lack of liberty because it equals profit. Because the Philippines is so dirt poor. If we do this, we will be rich. 
And like every other pyramid scheme, where you know back in the 80s it used to be fill these envelopes and you can get rich, now it's you know whatever random pill you can start selling somebody or whatever you know um, landmark style cult you can join can make you more profitable. It's kind of it's it's all kind of air. There's nothing else in there but air, and it's not even worth like breathing that air. So it's it's. You know, one of the things that kind of got me when I was filming there is this is a side of the Philippines that I, has always been restricted to me. Um, I was always kept in gated villages, being driven around. I could quite happily and quite blithely, like a number of Filipinos that live here and also abroad, anywhere else, um, live a life that's totally depoliticized. But because the main reason why I even left the Philippines was entirely political because my mother, my nanai, got on a list because she was an anti-Marcos activist. She split our family in half. We had family separation just there because my brother and my two sisters were too old to come with us. We sought asylum in America. Um, it split my parents for a time until my mom found a sponsor in Chicago. Dad came back to came back to the house, and you know, it's we you know we lived that that immigrant life where my mother with a doctorate in theology was cleaning and cooking and wiping old people's asses. And my father, who was an insurance executive with Sun Life, um, found himself working in a toothbrush factory. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that, that meant that I would never have, and I, ne and I never actually bought into Duterte. Nor did I buy into any of the other politicians that succeeded Marcos. Sure, so in answer to the first one, um, what the reaction has been. So this, this film is screened at, as a world premiere at Sheffield. It had a Filipino premiere at the Activista Festival in the Philippines. Um, it's been at the Austin Film Festival, and it's at Doc NYC, and it's gonna be at the Big Apple Film Festival, and it's here. So it hasn't really been seen by that many people. And of that sample pool uh, of the Filipinos who've seen it who aren't who I didn't send a special preview link to and who were you know, directly involved with the film. They were at Activista. Um, and the feedback I got from there was actually on the sort of positive side because I don't really kind of like sort of blowing on my own trumpet for a lot of things, but it's a way for people to basically interact with the subject without having somebody standing there with a placard shouting things at them. And it isn't, you know, an attempt to guilt trip somebody into a political viewpoint or try to convince somebody by, by, by shouting at them and shoving them into a hole they might not necessarily be comfortable with and that might actually trigger them. It's a portrait of a man at his place of work and his residence, what goes through there, and all the people that come in and out of that one space. And I, th I thought, I think by just limiting it to that and then following it from wherever it would take me would give you a, a greater authenticity as to what things are actually, what, what things are actually, what's actually going on. And, you know, a kind of a nice way of kind of divesting yourself of this kind of weird ego of being the kind of documentary filmmaker that's telling people what they should think. And I don't think, I mean, I, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I've, I've done that. And I don't think anybody I've worked with on this film has gone into this to tell people what to think. It's you present people and their lives, and then you feel as opposed to think. Um, and the second question in terms of what we can do, um, just keep talking to each other. You know, it's don't shut anybody out. Don't shut anybody down when it comes to somebody who doesn't necessarily agree with you. Yeah, they'll shout at you. Yeah, they'll hate you. Yeah, they'll say this. And you know, I've, rec I've received death and rape threats from people who've not even seen the film. Um, I'm not sure if they're entirely like real because uh, some of the accounts were set up in October 2019. Um, you know, so, but it doesn't really matter because it, it means it's on a kind of radar in the Philippines now. Um, it's past the censorship board, so. They can't really stop me from screening it there again. Um, but, um, or unless they kill people. But we just, 
have to start just talking to each other and keeping that conversation going um, and try to do it with lowered voices, slightly calm ways, sharing stories instead of saying, oh, here's a fact, here's a fact, here's a fact, here's a fact, here's this data, here's this data, Aren't you, don't you feel bad? Just say, okay, this is where I come from. This is my background. This is why I think the way I think and I feel the way I feel. And Orly was like that. You know, he's a complex guy. He, he, he loves a lot of people. He shows empathy, he shows sympathy, yet he still believes that people should be killed. How could you do that? You know, it's not black and white for him, nor should it be black and white for us. How I decided on the opening shot and the, and the other subsequent shots. I mean, this is a guy who runs a 24-hour morgue. You know, how, am I else, how else am I going to depict what goes on there? You know, it's going to be a difficult thing to, to tackle. He's not running an ice cream stand. So this is his daily place of work and where he lives and what he has to deal with and live with every day. I still get... Facebook Messenger messages from him going like, hey, como esta ate? How are you doing? I was like, yeah, that's not great. How's, you know, how's your day at work? He sends me a few pictures. I'm like, dude, <laughs> I'm like, thanks. I mean, you should see this guy's Facebook page. And, you know, and um, it's like, yeah, so it's like, yeah, there, there was, it was pretty much a no-brainer um, as to what we would be depicting. What we restricted ourselves on, however, because you, you, know, you get your sort of Susan Sontags who'll say to frame is to exclude, and what we decided to frame, and what we decided to exclude, is we didn't go to any crime scenes. We didn't show the police in any other way in this film apart from in passing or as a piece of set design, because we didn't want the focus to be on them. It isn't. Everyone keeps focusing on them. This isn't, you know, this whole situation about the drug war isn't about them. It isn't even about Duterte. It's about the people who are actually dying. It's about the poor who are dying as a result of this. Yeah, I mean, you know, Orly kind of said something similar to that of like, you know, I'm 67, what have I got to wish for? So when I asked him to take part in this film, um, I said, do you have any issues at all? Do you like, he's, and he's like, yeah, sure, open access. I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, open access. You can follow me, do whatever I want. You know, just don't follow me when I take a shit. I was like, yeah, you're, that's fine. But I kept him mic'd up, and so there's a few little sort of outtakes. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it's, you know, apart from that, you know, it's, it's kind of, and I think I remember the time when he ran away from the flying EPs. That was fun. But, you know, these flying cockroaches. But it's, you know, he had no concerns for his own safety. Uh, and when we asked Angelita, you know, I asked her quite upright, outright, and because we were rejected by something like nine or 10 different families because they were all scared, all scared. And I was like, Angelita, why are you? And her, her line was, or her answer to me was, I've already lost the most valuable thing to me. What else do I have to lose? So, you know, it's kind of, and the, the photojournalists like Vincent and Brother June and Ezra and Rafi and everybody there, they do this on a daily basis and they know the risks. You know, they're always, I mean, I'm working on another film called The Nightcrawlers, which is about them um, and the vigilantes. So, you know, they, they definitely know the risks to them and, and I knew the risks to myself and my risks are negligible. You know, I am a Balik Bayan Filipino with a very privileged upbringing, who can march in with a accreditation from Al Jazeera um, to make a film. Not everybody has that. You know, it's one of the few places in the world where you will find politicians dragging journalists out into a field um, on a pre-dug grave and shooting them dead. You know, it is dangerous, yes. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, there's no bones about it, really. <laughs> when you, you know you're putting your, you know, you know you're taking a risk if you're making any sort of film in the Philippines. And if you go into that 
thinking otherwise, yes, I know that I, I went, went, went into it with a reasonable amount of privilege, but I also, you know, we had a security team, we had constant checkups, I had to give, you know, a number of people various codes and various signals throughout the day to tell them I was alive and not kidnapped, because there were, and there are, real risks for journalists, no matter how innocuous you think your job is. It's not, ne it's not necessarily what you think the danger is, it's what somebody else thinks the danger is to them. Kuya. I mean, it's not unique to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. We do it here. Um, Americans do it in America, mm -hmm. British do it in, in, in Britain. Um, that's part of the industry and that's part of, you know, the capitalist wheel. Mm -hmm. um, and all these things that we see on screen and that we, that we, we don't read anymore, so that we see basically on a series of screens, um, you know, are there because somebody wants to make some money out of it and that there's a market involved yeah. for that. So I don't think that's necessarily um, entirely a, a uniquely Filipino thing. Whether it mm -hmm. kind of sucks the brain out of you yeah, it kind of does, but that's the whole point of it. Mm -hmm. It's so that you make collective choices in a zombie-like fashion so that you don't actually have to think about things or want to think about things or even have the patience to think about things. You know, we're, we're, we are messing with our own attention spans. One, that's pretty much what you sign up for when you become a journalist. Um, and you know, if you haven't got one already, find a good therapist. Um, and two, I try not to do that. You know, I have maintained contact with almost all of the characters um, that have been there. The dog that you see, unfortunately, was hit by a car a few weeks ago and is now dead. Um, so, you know, rest in peace, Bronson. But, you know, so he's the only one I'm not really in touch with. Um, and, you know, I'm Facebook friends with Angelita and with Anthony and with Orly. And we talk, you know, through the wonderful means of Facebook Messenger so the whole world can see what we're saying to each other. So have you ever been in a kind of state where you realize that you've totally screwed up or something really, really bad has happened to you and you wanted to fix it and you want to fix it now? Yeah, we all have, right? Be it through, I don't know, um, something that you did at school or something that you said to a friend or to, to, your, to your partner or whatever. And unfortunately, sometimes some of those effects and sometimes what you did um, has, you know, is gonna take a lot of time to fix but you still want to, f want to solve it and you want to solve it now. Um, and that's kind of what we're trying to do. You know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to fast track 450 odd years or so of, of Spanish occupation and American occupation. And essentially this sort of like ingrained mindset that's actually gone in and infiltrated our language where, you know, a good number of our nouns are still Spanish. And no, no amount of kicking out um, Americans from, from bases or any kind of you know, hyper de declarations of hyper-nationalism is going to cure the fact that we are very much like Latin America and South America, um, have found ourselves in a position where you know, we've been shat on by colonial powers and then just left to dry in the sun, you know? so. That's kind of you know that's kind of where I come from in terms of what I and what I think about what what kind of needs to be done and and our kind of knee jerk reaction of almost equating um, or aspiration of, of equating kind of our success with shiny things, which is why I think we you know there are certain people who always look at Singapore and always quote Singapore and say, oh yes we well, we want to be West or we don't want to have that because that's made in the Philippines we want this because it's imported it must be better. What we fail to see is that sometimes if it's imported, it's because the country that it was made for didn't want it and just wanted to sell it to us and get rid of it and still make some money out of it. So, you know, it's, it's just a lack of that perspective because what we've, we're basically drugged by this idea 
that those who colonized us know better. And that those who came over there and you know, imposed their power structures and their language, they're the ones that know better. We've not yet worked out that we can still figure this out for ourselves. Or we can use the, the fact that we've been colonized and we can use the tools that they've given us to make something that, are, that is uniquely ours. I mean, that's, for me, I think that that's a, that's a completely, like, that's a different film, and that's a film for somebody else to make. Maybe, you know, you could make that, um, or somebody else here. Um, my focus was a morgue that was open for 24 hours a day, and the guy that runs it, and everybody that comes in and out of it. That, you know, that, that's how I wanted to restrict myself, and I wasn't going to add any other element to that um, because I don't think it's necessary. You know, their stories stand up on their own. We don't need anybody else to speak for them. And I'm already doing enough of that by making a film with them, so. Um. Well, thank you so much for your generosity in answering all those questions and for this really. Um, strong film. I don't know how to qualify. <laughs> um, thank you so much to all of you for being here. Let's, let's just um, thank her once again. Thank you.